Next on KQED Newsroom. We want justice. Mounting tensions across the country and in the Bay Area as protests continue over racially charged cases in Ferguson and New York. Hundreds of San Jose's homeless evicted from one of the largest encampments in the country. Plus, diversifying high tech, empowering girls of color to embrace science and technology. So it's important for these girls to be able to have the skill sets to go into the industry, to really be able to change their lives and their communities by utilizing tech. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Racial tensions have flared from New York to the Bay Area over deadly encounters between white police officers and unarmed African-American males. Separate grand juries weighed two of the most high-profile incidents in Ferguson and New York. Both did not indict the officers, sparking ongoing demonstrations in multiple cities across the U.S., including many in the Bay Area. Civil rights advocates say these cases are igniting a national movement calling for change. The grand jury systems on a state level are broken and seem to lack the capacity to deal with police. As demands for reform in the justice system and police training mount, President Obama and officials like New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio are offering solutions. A full-scale retraining of this police force in this extraordinary facility is going to do a lot to improve the way our officers work with community members, improve the way they deal with each interaction, obviously work for a reduction in the use of excessive force. Fourth, and joining me now yes. with analysis are Jack Hart, senior consultant with Blue Courage and a San Francisco police lieutenant. Judge Ladores Cordell, San Jose's independent police auditor and Pastor Michael McBride, Director for the Lifelines to Healing Campaign with the PICO National Network. And Pastor Mike, let me begin with you. You were in Ferguson recently with other clergy reacting to the death of Michael Brown there. Uh, the current wave of protests now has spread well beyond that, including other incidents from New York to Cleveland to one tonight in Phoenix, uh, where there was a police shooting of an unarmed black man this week. What is different this time around that has galvanized so many people? Well, I, I, first, thanks for having me here. I think, you know, much largely, we, we need to contextualize everything that's been happening. I think people need to appreciate that this isn't just about Ferguson. Uh, if you understand the context and the history that even started with Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis, many of the young people that we spend time with in Ferguson from all over the country are actually coming into Ferguson. So momentum, I believe, has now reached a tipping point all across the country. The egregious nature of what we learned in Ferguson and what we saw with our own eyes with Eric Gardner, I think now has created uh, a moment where I don't think this is going to go away until massive structural reform is put in place. And uh, that's why I think many people are taking up the mantras that came out of Ferguson. We're going to shut it down and uh, we want no justice, no peace. I think people are, are tapping into a sentiment that is not new. It's just now reached, I think, maturation. Uh, organization and now a tipping point all across the country. You mentioned Eric Garner and that and uh, Eric Garner of course is the gentleman who was uh, in a chokehold mm -hmm. uh, in the New York case and Officer Pantaleo there was uh, not indicted by a grand jury. Lador Cordell, after Ferguson and Staten Island, uh, many people are suggesting that these types of cases should not ever go to grand juries in the first place because they rarely indict police officers. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Twee, half of the states in this country have criminal grand juries, and the half that and half of them do not, obviously. The half that do need to get rid of them. Uh, my view is that criminal grand juries provide political cover for prosecutors who either don't want to bring charges against a police officer or do want to. So if they do want to bring charges, they get, uh, they get heat from police officers and police unions. And if they don't want it, and if they don't want to charge, um, then they get heat from the community. So what better way mm. than you just convene a criminal grand jury, go in secret, you're the only one in there. You can engineer all the facts however you want it. And then 
put the blame on those individuals who are grand jurors. Uh, the grand jury system, criminal grand jury system, it's not, it, it is broken beyond repair. It does not serve the function for which criminal grand juries were originally created. So if the cases uh, don't go to a grand jury, where should they go? Well, grand juries determine probable cause. Was there probable cause to believe the officer engaged in criminal conduct? Well, preliminary examinations are what exist in all the states, and that's what most prosecutors use. Prosecutors use grand juries, criminal grand juries, in high-profile, controversial cases like officer-involved shootings where they don't want to take the heat or the responsibility for making the decision. And I want to bring Lieutenant Jack Hart here. As a police officer, what do you think of that? Should these cases involving police excessive force or allegations of excessive force should go to grand juries? Well, clearly transparency is important in these things. Uh, we've lost a lot of trust with our communities and lack of trust in the systems. Police officers have been enforcing laws for hundreds of years, and we have been on the wrong side of history in a lot of those decisions and enforcement actions that we've made. I went to the birthplace of Martin Luther King Jr. and inside of a gift shop in his house, I saw a picture of a white police lieutenant taking the fingerprints of Rosa Parks. And at that moment, I couldn't imagine how we could have been more wrong in the actions that we took, even though we were enforcing what, we, what at the time was thought of to be just laws. So we need to start building trust, and we certainly can't do that behind closed doors, yeah, as and you were saying. The transparency issue is very important because preliminary examinations are public hearings. The grand jury, secret. And, you know, the original purpose for secret grand juries was to protect people who were not indicted. Hmm. So they were brought before the grand jury, nobody knew about it, and then if they weren't indicted, their reputations were not harmed. Well, that whole purpose is defeated today because grand juries are convened in high-profile cases where the whole world knows who's coming in before the grand jury. So, so your San Jose's independent police auditor, would you support legislation, for example, that suggests that these types of cases go to a, an independent police auditor or a special review board? Right, so, Tui, you bring up the other issue of conflict of interest. So you have prosecutors and police officers who work together to bring cases that are prosecuted. Right? So when an officer is now involved, I believe there's a conflict of interest. So they're not at arm's length because they work so closely together. There should be independent prosecutors when there are officers that are, are coming before the courts for, for criminal activity. So absolutely, it should happen. I also think there should be legislation that says, do, do away with criminal grand juries. If we want to start, start here in California. And I'd even like to take that <laughs> further. I think many of us in this movement are starting to advocate for independent prosecutors at the federal level to remove all of the kind of conflict of interest, the relationships that may exist between law enforcement officers and between uh, prosecutors. How do we actually create distance that can create objectivity that allows for transparency and trust to be re instituted into a system that we think is deeply flawed and skewed towards African-American people, Latino people, immigrants, people of color, et cetera, et cetera. I want to take a moment to talk about officer training as well. And um, Lieutenant Hart, your group Blue Courage focuses on officer, officer training from a human uh, development perspective. You're one of the trainers. What is the current state of training for, our, for officers and, and what else needs to be done? We have extensive police training in police academies throughout California. Our peace officer standards and training has 43 different chapters or learning domains where it's very comprehensive training, but that's not where we're lacking. What we're lacking is after police officers go into the field, they're required to come back every two years for retraining. That retraining is focused 95% of the time on the tools that were issued and the skills to affect those tools. So we're very good at driving, shooting, force options, um, you know, putting handcuffs on people. But what we're not doing is talking about the heart set and the mindset of what it means to be a 21st century guardian of democracy. You know, our, our current training is, is great, but it it's definitely needs an upgrade. So this is where we believe the content of training also needs to include trainings around implicit bias and unconscious racial anxiety, things that geniuses from Stanford, like mm -hmm. Rachel Eberhardt, who just won a MacArthur Genius Award, has been uh, helping us in Oakland to train officers there. Now, Oakland, by no stretch of the imagination, is the panacea of policing. But we have in Oakland, through these implicit bias trainings, been able to go almost 18 months without an officer-involved shooting because we do believe 
that it does teach officers uh, to pause and to think and to uh, humanize and take uh, uh, ownership of some of their own uh, implicit biases that all of us carry due to the way we've been shaped in a society that criminalizes black bodies and often defaces our humanity in broad strokes. What you, what you hear from police officers is, is they very tend to be very defensive on the issue of race. They will say, I'm not a racist. I have friends who are people of color. But that's not the point. That's not really getting at what's going on. It's about perceptions. Mm -hmm. and, and you cannot live in America. Mm -hmm. You cannot live in America mm -hmm. and not have biases. Mm -hmm. And the key is recognizing those biases and then figuring out how not to utilize them right. when is, you're engaging in policing. And this is why we spend so much time talking about leadership materials, books, Daniel Pink's drive. We look at practical wisdom. We look at Plato and Aristotle. But of all the tools like meditation, present moment awareness, respect, actually defining what that means, um, positive psychology for police officers, and that the actions of a police officer in an instant can affect a person for life and a community for generations. But it, 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 it's super, mentioned race. I mean, yes. Yes. and all of that. But but race, you can be respectful and kind. But if your perception of a dark-skinned person, a male, is that this is a problem, you know, and if that's what kicks in, you can have all the respect and all the training in the world. That's not going to solve the problem. The deeper thing we have to just appreciate, even about race, and this is why I think the country is responding with such uh, animation. People are starting to nuance the conversation of race beyond just interpersonal interactions and appreciate that we have racialized structures and the yes. way that these structures are performing race in this country also need to have a better analysis and this is why i think our president progressives who love to be the champions of people of color and poor people all of us have to develop a very deeper nuanced analysis around race and the structures and that i think is the leadership and courageous opportunity in this moment let me ask uh judge cordell very quickly that's one side of the equation uh, officer training. What about training for people of color, young people of color, in how to deal with uh, police officers very well, quickly? Absolutely. Here. It's critical for survival. So I teach uh, young people the rule of don't be a rat. Three, three things you never do with a police officer. You never run, R. You never argue, A. And you never touch a police officer. Get that ingrained. You do have responsibilities, but then you have rights. To Important. And we do to want remember. to hear about it Thank if you. you have a complaint. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, Lieutenant Jack Hart with Blue Courage and with San Francisco Police, also Pastor Michael McBride and LaDoris Cordell, the Independent Police Auditor in San Jose. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Well, this week, the city of San Jose cleared out hundreds of people from one of the largest homeless encampments in the country. It was known as the jungle, just 10 miles away from Apple's head headquarters and not far from other symbols of Silicon Valley wealth. The encampment had become an embarrassment to San Jose. City and county agencies say they've spent $4 million on subsidized housing and services for the homeless, but critics contend it's not enough. Scott Schaefer paid a visit to the jungle this week, one day before it was dismantled, and has this report. This encampment known as the jungle has been home for more than 300 people. Over the years, jungle residents built tree houses and arranged outdoor furniture across nearly 70 acres of land. But this week, the city of San Jose posted yellow signs, warning residents of the jungle to get out. There are 7,600 homeless people in Santa Clara County. Uh, the vast majority of those live here in San Jose. Um, and there's about 350 or 400 people living here in the jungle right now. Eileen Richardson is executive director of Downtown Streets Team, a nonprofit that's been working to move people out of the jungle and into subsidized housing. People are packing up and, and leaving. The encampment needs to be shut down. There's a lot of uh, dangerous activity going on. Um, it, there's pollution going on in the creeks that, are, that run along here. So um, yeah, the city is left with no choice. Last year, the San Jose City Council set aside $4 million to find housing for homeless people. Downtown Streets Team is one of several groups that's been working with the city in the months before the scheduled eviction. The city has given us money to have seven intensive caseworkers come down and then house the men and women that live down here. It's really impressive when you think of um, the backgrounds and, and all that, uh, what, what our caseworkers can do. After eight months here, Kathleen Ann Claymore says Downtown Streets Team helped her find a place to live. I'm about to get a place for me and my kids, and we can all be together. They don't have to go home at night or be with my aunt. You know, they can be with me, and I could take care of them. And I've always worked, 
I've had good jobs. I have, you know, a lot of skills. And so I'm, I'm willing to do whatever I can because these kids are my life. The city says so far 144 jungle residents have found stable housing, but now it's time to shut the encampment down. Increasing crime, growing piles of garbage and human waste, all of it fueling neighborhood complaints. This week's rains are also swelling the creek, threatening to flood the grounds. Ray Bramson leads the city's homeless response unit. The city's been facing a challenge with homelessness for years and years. This site presents such an unsafe, unstable, and unsanitary condition and way of living that we're not going to allow it here in our community again. We're committed to keeping the site patrolled with rangers paired with San Jose police officers and making sure that this sort of situation never occurs in our city again. City and county agencies have opened up additional shelter beds and are working to develop more affordable housing, but it's a long process and the city can't go it alone, says Bramson. More than anything else, there's a lack of affordable housing in our community, lack of that long-term stable housing where people can afford, stay in, and be permanently housed and rejoin the community. San Jose is the third largest city in California and home to immense Silicon Valley wealth, where tech giants like Apple, Facebook, and Google are headquartered. Many say the success of those companies has driven up housing prices. According to the property listing service Zillow, the median cost of a rental unit in San Jose is nearly $3,000. This is a community problem and it requires a community solution. The community plan to end homelessness gives that venue for, to involve corporations, to involve governments, to involve the general public in this group solution. We need consensus and we need to all work together. In Silicon Valley as a whole, we have what's called a jobs housing imbalance. Sandy Perry is a minister and affordable housing advocate. How would you grade the city of San Jose? Uh, I think it's failed. It's failed and I think this is an example of the failure that they have to bring in police and evict people and move people out. Here we are in Silicon Valley, the center of technology, and we can't even keep people from freezing to death in the winter. Perry thinks the city should provide legal campsites for those being forced out. On Thursday morning, the garbage trucks moved in. This story has gotten strong national coverage in part due to the stark economic divide between residents of the jungle and the venture capitalists and tech titans of Silicon Valley. We work with tech and, and private sector to some degree, but there hasn't really been anyone who stepped up and said, you know, they want to be a champion. Jennifer Loving is executive director of Destination Home, a public-private partnership focused on finding affordable housing to reduce chronic homelessness. We have several thousand people on our streets every single night. So even solving one encampment, two encampments, four encampments, there's almost 300 encampments in this in this community and so our problem is much long, larger than any one place. The jungle may be gone but San Jose's homeless problem is not. Well another issue in Silicon Valley is the lack of diversity in high tech particularly when it comes to people of color and women. Kimberly Bryan has made it her business to bridge that gap. She's the founder of Black Girls Code. The nonprofit exposes girls of color to the world of computer science and technology, encouraging them to break the mold and be innovators. Bryant is a recipient of the first annual Women Who Rule Awards given by Politico, Google, and the Tory Burch Foundation. I spoke to her earlier. Kimberly Bryant, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations on your latest award. Thank you very much. Uh, you started Black Girls Code in San Francisco three years ago. What inspired you? I was really inspired by girls like my daughter, Kai, who was 12 at the time, going into middle school and really interested in technology, but not really understanding that she could create something with it as opposed to just using it. And I was looking for something that could really interest her and keep her engaged and also help her to really be more creative. So how does your group go about encouraging uh, African-American girls to study computer programming? We really try to tap into the things that they like the most. So if that's doing computer games, if that's doing robotics, if that's doing web design, or even using their mobile phone, we try to build workshops around that and show them how to take the things that they're doing every day on a day-to-day -day basis and be a technology innovator with that from that particular angle and that's how we really hook them and get them involved. And you're an electrical engineer by training. And I am. You worked in biotech for a long time so you have a technical background. Mm -hmm. 
Why do you think it's so critical for young girls, especially African-American girls, to have these skills? I think it's really important for this generation to understand technology and really become involved in the industry because the pace of innovation is so fast. And the jobs that are going to be created over the next 10, 20 years are all going to be STEM related. So they're all be some form of math, science, technology type of industry. So it's important for these girls to be able to have the skill sets to go into the industry, to really be able to change their lives and their communities by utilizing tech. It's no secret that women are severely underrepresented uh, in tech. In fact, men make up 60 to 70 percent of the staff at many tech companies, including some of the Bay Area's largest, Google, Facebook, Yahoo. Why are there so few women in tech? Is it because they're simply not interested or there's discrimination in hiring or is it both? I think it really is a little bit of both. So when I graduated at the end of the 80s, that was a peak for women receiving degrees in computer science. So that was about 30 percent. Now it's less than 18 percent. So we've seen this drastic fall in the over the last several decades. Why the drop? I think for one, uh, we really went into the computer boom right after I graduated. And the face of the industry and the culture of the industry started to change drastically. So when we were going through that web 2.0 stage, just the industry as a whole started to change from a cultural standpoint and not be as welcoming to women. And I think that pushed a lot of women out. And it didn't really help in terms of getting women to have mentors and role models as far as the new generation that's coming behind them. So based on what you've seen in your three years or so of workshops and classes, is there a particular age or grade where introduction to computers is most effective? It is really, that's a hard question to answer. So it really depends because we have toddlers and we have kids that are in preschool that are utilizing um, games on an iPad. So this is really a generation that we call digital natives. So they're coming almost out the womb, uh, being able to use a cell phone. So we try to start at that age where we can really teach content. So we start at seven. But it can start earlier than that. I think as early as five, maybe even in four or three, we can start utilizing technology as a means to teach our students and teach our kids and then move them into gradually more progressively um, harder context from what we're doing in the classroom. Are there tech women leaders in Silicon Valley that you hold up as examples to the girls in your camps? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we have women like Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer, but they're, they're both white women. They're mm -hmm. accomplished, but are there women of color in particular? Um, there are very few women of color, unfortunately, that are heading tech companies are really showing the lead in terms of STEM careers. I think there's some that are everyone knows, like Mae Jemison, that has really done a lot from the standpoint of engineering and science. But that's really what we're trying to do is really create this next generation of innovators that can be mentors to girls younger than themselves. Some people have called the push for more diversity in tech really the next step in the civil rights movement. Do you mm -hmm. agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's important for people of color um, and even women it, to really be a part of this innovative change that we're seeing. I, I really think this is the next industrial, so to speak, revolution is technology. And so if we have over half of our percent of our population that's not participating, we are creating a permanent underclass. So I absolutely see it as a civil rights issue in terms of making sure tech is free and everyone has access to be able to utilize tech as creatives and not just as consumers. So what is next for Black Girls Code? Um, for Black Girls Code, we're really hoping to continue to grow the organization and reach more students. It's always about expanding our impact. So adding additional chapters in new cities and really seeing our program grow and touch girls all over the country and beyond. And you're already in seven U.S. cities as well as Johannesburg, South Africa. Yes, and we're moving to Uganda this year as well. So we continue to expand internationally and hoping to go into eight new cities in 2015. Well, much luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And I know Absolutely. you're going to Washington on Monday to get your award. I am. <laughs> I am looking forward to it. Have a good trip. Kimberly Bryant, thank you. Thank you.
And joining me now for a look at other news is Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tui. Well, we uh, have been following the drought, and it's been a huge issue. We've got some rain this week, lots of rain, and more on the way. Does it go far in having some kind of an impact on the drought? You do hear people saying, is the drought over? And, of course, it isn't. I mean, it's very helpful. Uh, it is now the official end of the wildfire season. The ground is getting saturated, which is good. Uh, but we've had such a huge deficit uh, in rain over the last three years that it's going to take much, much more rain, of course, uh, to really put a dent. The good news is now that the ground is wet, the, whatever rain we get this weekend and beyond, it's gonna, it is going to begin to refill the reservoir. So that's great. But the state water officials say we need 150% uh, of normal this year to kind of catch up. Uh, but the national weather experts, though, are saying a, a different picture. They do. They have a different measurement, and they say we need uh, uh, as much as 18 to 21 inches, which sounds a lot better than 75 inches. But it really depends on where you're measuring the rain. The, 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 the message is the same. Uh, it's going to take storm after storm after storm to even begin to come close to ending this drought. In the meantime, conservation is really the only answer. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. We were talking earlier about how there's a new uh, report out in the American Geophysical uh, Union Journal that says this is the worst drought we've had in 1,200 years. So, yeah, at yeah. least. I uh, also wanted to talk to you about a situation coming up next year, which is starting next month. Undocumented immigrants in California will be able to get driver's licenses. And this week, a new DMV office opened in San Jose to help them do just that. Exactly. It's one of four offices the DMV is opening around the state. They're expecting to serve about a million people uh, who will be eligible to take the driver's test. They're going to have touch screens in all kinds of languages. Uh, they're doing cultural diversity training and so on. Of course, they have to pass the tests still, but uh, they do expect a lot of traffic in there to people coming in and trying to get uh, uh, driver's licenses. And the Mexican consulate in L.A. has uh, been providing driver's education. Yes, which is a good thing. You <laughs> yes. know, if they're going to get licenses, we want them to be good drivers. And, uh, you know, but what they were finding is that a lot of people, like over 70 percent, were failing the test. You know, so they do need to, uh, like all of us, learn learn the rules of the road before they get the license. And speaking of education, just real quickly, uh, the state legislature this week has uh, a bipartisan bill that would take away UC's financial independence. How would that work? Well, this would have to be a constitutional amendment, so it would need two-thirds votes in the legislature, uh, and then it would go to the voters in 2016, and uh, it would mean that the legislature would get control over things like salaries for chancellors and tuition hikes. Okay. I see a big battle brewing over that. Oh, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah, Thank absolutely. Thank you, Scott. You bet. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.